Madrid and oh, <clears throat> and uh, first of all, I want to thank the organizer to give me the opportunity to present the, the work that in the following uh, half an hour I will explain you, which is about quantum spin glasses, in particular the, the phase transition in uh, the two-dimensional model. Uh, this work has been done uh, with the Professor Bernaschi, Martin Mayor and Parisi, and is available in archive and we also create a suite of GPU programs that contains all the different programs we develop uh, around our study, which is now available in the computer physics communication repository. At the end of the presentation, I will share with you the links directly to the, the suite of, or, or to the archive if someone uh, wants to take a look of, of them. Okay, so before go directly to the, the quantum spin glasses, let's start with a really brief introduction to the classical spin glasses. As probably you know, they try to model disordered magnetic alloy. To do this, for example, we can use the, the Edward Anderson model, which have this Hamiltonian to represent the energy of the system. In this model, the, the spins of the system are the, in the nodes of a lattice and have two possible states, for example, down and up. And these spins, which interact only at nearest neighbors, have a coupling constant J, which could be ferromagnetic or antiferromagnetic. This situation, because the, the Js are random along the system, uh, propose a situation like this one, where some spins, for example, this or this one, cannot satisfy all the interaction at the same time. At the same time, we refer to this spin as a frustrated spin, and we can measure the total frustration of the system through the energy <clears throat> associated with this frustration and the disorder of the system. Spin glasses present a really uh, root-free energy landscape with uh, so many local minima and tall energy barriers. This make it really difficult to explore the configuration space in order to minimize the energy of the system. In, in particular, as you know, for non-planar graph, this problem becomes a NP-complete problem, making a spin glasses the simplest physical system associated with this kind of problems. And in particular, quantum annealers try to solve this problem of minimize the energy of a spin glass. To do this, we need to move to the quantum spin glasses, which is the main topic of, of our work. In particular, the, looking at the Hamiltonian, we have the original Edward Anderson Hamiltonian, but now with the Pauli matrices. And we also add an extra term which doesn't commute with the original one, which is associated with a, a external magnetic field, a gamma, a, <clears throat> which a, is applied in the transversal direction. In this situation, this system has a new a phase diagram, as we can see here for the two and three dimensional models where uh, the original one is modified by the application of the external field. Uh, quantum annealers uh, propose to reach the origin of these diagrams that contains the solution of the original problem. To reach this point, which is inside the spin glass phase, we try to start by cooling down the system in the paramagnetic phase, and if the external field is large enough, this term is neglected, and we reach really fast the, the ground state of the system, which have this form. Now, looking at the diagram, we can say that only by reducing the, the external field, we eventually reach the, the, ground, the ground state of the original problem. However, this process must be adiabatical because in order, uh, uh, if it's not adiabatical, we can 
uh, jump to other state and not remains in the grown state along the process. And here, adiabatical, as probably you know, refers to the fact that the time needed to remove the external field, the annealing time, must be much larger than the inverse of the energy gap between the grown state, which is the solution we want, and the first excited state. <clears throat> in addition, as you can see in both uh, diagrams, we have to cross the critical point to enter the spin glass phase. And from the theory, it's possible to show that this uh, energy gap is, uh, scales with the system size as uh, some power law. And in addition, this exponent set is the critical dynamical exponent of the transition, making really interesting for quantum annealer study the transition point and in particular obtain this exponent. In, as I said before, we focus your attention in the two-dimensional mode. Another important thing of this system is that if we flip all the spins in the lattice, the energy doesn't change. So we say that the, the system is parity symmetry. This transformation is performed by the parity operator and allow us to split the energy spectrum in two, in two sectors. But moreover, we can classify the, the state according to the effect of this parity operator over then having an uh, even state and odd state. But also we can do the same with the operator. In the following slide, I will talk about odd operator and even operator, as well as even and odd uh, state. With this main picture of the problem, we can try to make the relevant questions to the quantum analysis. The first one is clear and is associated with the uh, determination of the dynamical exponent set. Previous wars in the middle of the 90s, from Rieger and John using numerical study of different dimensionalities, reported that for the two-dimensional model, we have a finite value, uh, uh, like 1.5, okay? But more recent results from Miyazaki and Nishimori reported that using the renormalization method, uh, reported that superalgebraical scale for the energy gap, which is a problem for quantum annealers because it's not only difficult to read the grown state, it's impossible to enter the spin glass uh, phase in an adiabatical way. Apart from the value of set, because it is unknown, the problem is that we are not sure that we can study the, the critical point using the usual techniques like the finite set scaling. Okay, but Moreover, we talk about the parity symmetry and we say that it has a special role in the, in the system. So it affects the value of the, the exponent. And in general, uh, we can ask about if we are able to uh, characterize the, the nature of this phase transition obtaining the critical exponent. To do this and answer this question, we propose two different strategies. The first one consists in the exact diagonalization of the transfer matrix. <clears throat> Thus, as uh, some of you probably know, it scales really fast with the system side, making it a, a huge matrix for even really small systems. It's true that we can use the parity symmetry to use a smaller system, but <clears throat> it remains to be a really, really large matrices. To have an idea of how, how large are them, say that we, to, to obtain enough memory to allocate these matrices, our program needs at least 20 GPUs. <clears throat> okay, so making really hard to go for a system larger than six using the exact diagonalization. Uh, your program, without going details, use the Pepsi and Slepsi libraries. And we also create from scratch a really custom program that performs the Langshot algorithm using a multi-GPU CPU approach for the matrix vector product. 
the other strategy that try to solve the problem of cannot study large uh, system consists in use the quantum Monte Carlo. <clears throat> to do this, we start by using the Trotter Suzuki approximation that converts the original quantum uh, system in D dimensions into a classical one with an extra dimension. Uh, it's usual refers to this extra dimension as Euclidean time or Euclidean dimension, and in your system have a, a size of LT. And <clears throat> it's really easy to identify this extra dimension by looking at the final uh, action of the system after applied the approximation. Here we can see that the original spin glass interaction remains in the XY plane, but in the extra dimension, we have a ferromagnetic interaction. We also add an extra parameter K as usual that is connected with the original field by this expression. <clears throat> so from now on, I will talk about K because the, the simulation are performed by choosing the value of K, but uh, always remember that it's connected with the external field. Um, before continue, say that when K grows, gamma decreases, so we can think in this parameter K as something similar to the inverse uh, temperature usual in uh, statistical physics for the uh, external field. <clears throat> Other problems is that uh, we are not able to know in advance the value of set and it will be infinity. So in order to circumvent this problem, we notice that we need to read the zero temperature limit, which through the connection between the, the size of the system in the Euclidean direction and the temperature is equivalent to take an infinity large system in this extra dimension. Uh, other interesting things that we can connect the correlation function of some observable measure along the Euclidean time with the energy gaps that are the, the ones connected with the uh, critical dynamical exponent. In particular, if we look at the correlation function of odd operators, like the correlation between spins in the same side at different times, Euclidean times, it is con uh, it decays with the um, energy gap, and also we can define only for for our work a correlation length that make easy to to talk about this uh, associated with this gap. But more interesting is that if we move to the even operator, like the correlation of a link uh, at different times, they don't decay with the energy gap, it decays with the energy gap of a state in the same parity sector, making the, the parity symmetry really relevant for, for the system. <clears throat> As I said before, we use this uh, strategy in order to simulate larger system. The largest one that we can simulate is 24. L equal 24 and a lot of sample in order to obtain enough uh, statistic to obtain a good uh, a good estimation of each observables and the quantities we want to measure. Uh, the program use a parallel tempering equilibration uh, algorithm in order to equilibrate really fast the system at, without say anything about the program only said that we use a multi-GPU code that we developed from scratch and we obtain a really good uh, performance. In particular, the, the speed update of the system is comparable with a specific design hardware like Janus 2. Okay, so let's go and say something about the result we obtain, which is probably the, the most interested part. And let's start with the exact diagonalization. In the exact diagonalization, we obtain the lowest uh, forward state in the in terms of the energy. And um, from them, we can extract the, the energy gaps. And 
we notice that there is a hierarchy of gaps. In particular, if you look here, the this scheme uh, summarizes this the result that I'm going to show you in the following slide. But the main idea is that the energy gap associated with different parity state is really small, comparable if we compare it with the energy gap in the same uh, parity sectors. So we obtain this. And if we move to the idea of the correlation length, we obtain the opposite relation. Now, if I show you how you how we obtain this D result is by simply looking at the empirical distribution function of the correlation length. Remember always that the correlation length and the gaps are connected. In particular, if we compare the distribution function for the correlation length and the even correlation length, the first one is much spread and also have a strong dependence on the value of k which is associated with this smaller gap uh, for the different parity sector. We also look at the distribution function for the ratio between the, the odd and even correlation length. And we see that they are from, for they have the same order of magnitude approximately, but it's true that the, the odd uh, energy gap usually is smaller than the even gap. Now, <clears throat> let's move to the Monte Carlo result. But first of all, we need to be sure that we reach the zero temperature limit. To do this, we notice that we can use a trick that consists in compare uh, the estimation of an observable uh, in a system with periodic boundary condition in the Euclidean time and anti-periodic boundary condition in the Euclidean time. If, for example, we look at the correlation length of an even operator, we can see that, for example, the, the anti-periodic uh, boundary estimation converts to the limit from below, while the periodic ones convert from above. So we uh, convince us by looking at all the samples and different observables that the, they converge from opposite sides. And then we have a, a good uh, way to, uh, to be sure that we are in the zero temperature limit. With this idea, we define different one-time observables. In particular, all of them can be constructed through the these correlation matrices and the most relevant ones are the general susceptibility and also the general spatial correlation length. We refer this to general because here n give us the number of uh, correlation matrices that we have used in the estimation of the magnitude and saying that for n equal to we recover the usual spin glass uh, susceptibility and a spatial correlation length. So now we can move to study this correlation length to be uh, to confirm that we are in the zero limit, zero temperature limit. Sorry. So if we represent the correlation length, or for example the binder or the parameter that we can estimate from the matrices. Uh, we can see that the curve for the largest system for periodic and anti-periodic uh, boundary condition are equal, at least in terms of the of the error we obtain from the, the Monte Carlo. Then we are sure that we are in the limit and we can pass uh, to the problem of uh, study the critical point. To do this, we look at the same correlation length, but for the different system size and taking account that the, the theory predict that in the critical point, this uh, magnitude um, have this expression is connected with a function. So then all the curves uh, have to cross in some point. Looking at the, at the zoom, we can see that in some region, we have this crossing point and we can extract um, a critical point. 
We also perform a finite side disk scaling, as we can see in the uh, in the right panel, uh, and we uh, collapse all the curves for a single one that allow us to estimate the different uh, critical exponents. In particular, we obtain this result uh, for the critical point and the critical exponent. Notice that we can define different gamma exponent associated with H definition of the of this general uh, correlation uh, correlation length knowing the critical point we can uh, put the system in this uh, value of k and, uh, and also study the energy gaps and and then obtain the critical dynamical exponent let's start with the same parity gaps as we do in the in the exact diagonalization, we start by looking directly the empirical distribution function of the even correlation length. As we said before, it's not uh, really spread in, it's not a really spread distribution and we don't see a, a strong uh, system side dependence. So we try with a power law scaling in order to collapse all the largest curves into a single one. To do this, we introduce a, a scaling parameter, which is connected with a new um, di a dynamical exponent, the even dynamical exponent, <clears throat> which is associated only with the uh, interaction between a state in the same parity sector, in the same parity sector. By this process, we obtain that this exponent is 2.46, but the important thing for quantum annealers and, and so on is that it's finite. It has a finite value as previous numerical word from the 90s from uh, Rick and Joe uh, and John predict. <clears throat> Moving to the problem of estimate the different parity gaps, we have a terrible spread um, distribution function as we see in the previous slide for the exact diagonalization. But in addition, we have a really strong dependence on the system side. Said that for the largest system, we are not being able to um, estimate the value of the correlation length for some, some samples because they are uh, really, really large. So the, the, the system has a really, really small uh, energy gap. And this should be associated with a, a levy fly. In other words, that the distribution function of this energy gap have a really, really uh, fat tail. To confirm this idea, we feed your data for the largest system, as we can see in the right plot for the largest system. We obtain that the, the exponent b is smaller than one, as we expect from the behavior of the distribution function for largest value of uh, the correlation length. So after talk about everything, uh, let me summarize in the conclusion the main idea of our work, which start by the characterization of the a quantum phase transition for spin glasses in two dimension by obtaining the critical point and also different critical exponent. We notice that the parity have a special role in this problem, not only because it split the configuration space, but moreover, because we can, um, we can define an extra critical dynamical exponent. This one, which is associated with the interaction of a state in the same parity sectors uh, is finite, while the, the dynamical exponent associated with the different parity gap remains to be, or seems to be divergent as a previous work uh, from Nishimori uh, Miyazaki predicts. And what is the, the summarize for quantum annealers? So looking at this, we can say that an ideal quantum annealer, and here 
EDR refers to an annealer that doesn't mix the even anode excitations, could enter adiabatically the spin glass phase. What happens be between enter the spin glass phase and reach the zero external field is still an open question, but we at least enter the, the spin glass phase. Uh, thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much. So now the uh, session is open for discussion comment. So any question comment? So if you have, okay, Sebastian, please. Okay. Uh, hello, I'm uh, Sebastiano Pilati from the University of Camerino. Uh, thank you very much for the very interesting talk. Uh, so my question is a bit technical. So at the beginning of the presentation, you have uh, uh, discussed the uh, Trotter-Suzuki approximation. Uh, then it's not clear to me whether uh, uh, you perform your, your simulations uh, in the zero time step limit. That is, you take a very small uh, uh, time step in the Euclidean time or whether you even use a, a continuous time uh, algorithm. Uh, um... the, the algorithm use a finite uh, time step, but the, the idea is that uh, I show you directly. If you give me a second, I will go directly to the to the action of the Trotter Suzuki after apply the Trotter Suzuki approximation. <clears throat> the, the point is that when you apply the, the Trotter Suzuki approximation here, the, the original system transforms into an equivalent one, which is equivalent, for example, for us, we work with a two dimensional system. So now we have a three dimensional system. Okay, the idea of take uh, the, the, the true approximation becomes exactly if you take L tau equal infinity. And the, the idea to be sure that we are in L tau equal infinity at the end um, is that the, the idea of the trick of compare the anti-periodic and boundary condition. At the beginning, you start with a really tiny system in this direction. And we can see like uh, here, sorry, here they don't convert. The, the anti-periodic and periodic boundary condition don't converge. And I take this picture from a value of K where are a little bit inside the, the spin glass phase to be sure that we don't reach this limit, okay? The limit of L tau equal infinity. If you take L tau equal infinity, it's equivalent to, to have a, uh, to take the limit of the step in the, in the, in the Trotter Suzuki approximation, go to zero. Uh, I, okay, yes, I understand that there are two limits. One is reaching zero temperature, uh, and one is uh, having a zero uh, or a very small time step. Uh, so I, I understand that you, you take both the limit uh, at the same time by taking L tau going to infinity. Yes, because they are connected at the end. Okay, okay, understand. Thank you. Mm, okay, so any question or comment? One more this. Ah, I have a question. The uh, please uh, go back to the your final slide conclusions, right? Sorry, uh, will you repeat please, it? Uh, please, uh, please go to the conclusion. Conclusion slide of conclusion. Can you hear? Uh, me? Isaro, go go to the last slide. Last slide, yes, please. Ah, yes. okay. Sorry, sorry. Thank I, thanks, thanks. I yeah. think you you are asking about the the conclusion of the but. Uh, ah, yes, this one. Yes, that's right. Yes. So, and the last sentence, please. Can you see okay. the last? Yes. So, what is the meaning of ideal? So, ideal means that there are no decoherence or no dispersion or something. The, the, the idea is that um, I. Give me a second. I move to mm -hmm. to the okay here. Yes. Okay. Um, the idea is that uh, an mm -hmm. ideal quantum annealer uh, only works inside this event sector. Mm -hmm. 
okay? Because the initial state is an uneven state. Mm -hmm. Because when you start the, after cooling the system, when you have a really large uh, external field, the ground state is uh, even. Mm -hmm. Okay, so because I show you, uh, because the parity is uh, split the, the Hamiltonian mm -hmm. in two yes, terms, yes, yes, even, if you yes, start yes. with an even mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. state, we remain in an even state because mm -hmm. this direct sum of the, the terms. Mm -hmm. So the, it's ideal in the sense that the odd sector don't mm -hmm. affect you. You ah, don't mix okay. the I sector. See, see. Okay. In principle, if you perform everything well, Mm -hmm. The, the mm -hmm. theory predicts that if you start in an even state, you remain in an even state. Mm -hmm. But at the end, in when you move to the real world, you you can have some mixing. Ah, okay. Yes, I see. Yes, mixing. Okay. Good. So okay. Ah, so Hilbert, please. I can't hear you. Ah, ah yes, Sorry. we can hear you. The, the... Please. Yes. Ah, uh, yes. Sorry, yeah, that's not working. Okay, good. Okay. Yes, uh, thank you very, very nice talk. I, I'm, a, <clears throat> I'm a bit confused <clears throat> about these sectors. So I, I understand that this, these sectors arise because you don't have a, an external z-direction field in your Hamiltonian. Is that is that correct? You don't have an external field in the... Sorry, in the? In the z-direction. So you don't have a, a, a single sigma, <laughs> a sigma z term. Yeah, yeah but the... the... The, the problem is that when you apply an external field, it breaks the, the symmetry. Exactly. exactly. Be because so, you, you prefer one over the other uh, direction. Right? That so this, it, this is it, true. This is a point that when you move to include this external field, the, the, the symmetry is breaking and you have other problems. So then it means that this, this story about the even and odd sector only applies if the Hamiltonian has uh, just only this pair interaction, not a single spin interaction. Is that is that correct? Uh, I'm not sure because at, at the end you, you have the, the, I have to check. I think that the, the, the idea is that when you introduce the external field in the set direction, you change the universality class and then it's, uh, effectively you don't have the, the same behavior. Here, the, the idea is that because we are in the critical point, the, the universality class of the problem must be the same. But if you change the universality class, uh, you don't have the same behavior. So probably, as you say, when you introduce the, the external field, if it's strong, because now you can say, okay, I have a, I break the, the symmetry, but if the external field is Tiny will be have it cannot affect uh, enough the 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 energy state, but it's something that probably we need to check. And I've I've related so okay so so in in general for combinatorial optimization problems of the cubo type yes uh, <clears throat> you would have to ensure that the Hamiltonian is symmetric right yes. And, uh, maybe also planar. I don't know whether that's uh, is that is that a constraint also. Yeah, yeah. Probably the 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 main idea is that uh, of course if you have the the symmetry, the parity symmetry, everything goes well. But if you don't have it, you have the problems. So if yeah. you start with the cubo, uh, when you don't have the equivalent of the external field. Sorry, I'm not really inside of the cubo problem. I always from the spin glass. Uh, but as you said, probably if you break the symmetry, you have other other yeah. behavior in the energy sector. Now I'm a little bit confused. So to, as a follow up question, I'm a little bit confused about this this external field in the x direction because if you know think of it classically, it's like it corresponds to like a single spin flip, and it would it would suggest that you actually go with a single spin flip from even to odd. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, but that, apparently that that intuition is is wrong. Uh, but my question is, how do you think that this analysis depends on the kind of transverse term that you introduce? So this is a, 
a single spin uh, uh, sigma x term, but if you would have a double spin sigma x term, like you know that you do with two that you do a coordinated flip of two spins or something like that. I mean, does <clears throat> does this kind of uh, does but that the, affect uh, your results? At the end, um, you need a, a global symmetry. If you if you only change two spins, the interaction with the other with the other spins, the the interaction will be the same, but with the other spins, it's not the same. So it's not a symmetry. You need to apply, for example, a gauge symmetry. It will be uh, remain equal the energy, and in particular, the parity symmetries a uh, special case of the gauge symmetry. But then other transformation is not a symmetry, so it affects to the energy. So the, here, the idea is that the parity symmetry doesn't affect the, the Hamiltonian, and you can prove it by transform the Hamiltonian by the parity matrices, yeah. uh, by the parity operator. You put a parity operator in both sides, and you recover the original. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah it commutes. Yeah. It commutes, so you have this symmetry. And then if you do other transformation, you don't have a symmetry, so other kind of physics appears. Okay, thank you, thank you. And the, the other question in, you ask about the introduction of the field in the X direction. So the okay. idea is that if here I put the, the, for example, in the Y direction, I have the same because this term doesn't commute with this one, but if it's in the Z direction, uh, it's a classical system because we don't have any um, uh, quantum fluctuation associated with the non-commutation of both terms. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so, okay, last quick question, please. Mas Massimo, please. Ma yes, uh, I want just to add a comment uh, to what uh, Hilbert asked. Uh, you are right. Uh, uh, it is not, uh, it may be not trivial, to transform a general combinatorial optimization problem in a cube problem. Uh, usually it's a sort of art to find the right, I mean, at times it's trivial, but in general it's not trivial. So it's a sort of problem by itself to transform the classic combinatorial problem in a cube problem. But this does not change the uh, the, say the problem that we want to study that was to understand if the quantum annealing may be an advantage with respect to say classic simulated annealing for solving a combinatorial problem, combinatorial optimization problem. So, so that means that you say that this result is relevant for combinatorial optimization. Is that what you're suggesting? It it is uh, uh, from the yes. point of view that. Uh, provide uh, support uh, uh, to the chance of, of having uh, uh, the quantum annealing uh, uh, going faster uh, than any classical, uh, say, thermal annealing to, to the ground state. It's relevant from this viewpoint. Yeah, but it, it my concern is that the, there is, of course, the chance that the kind of Kubo problems that you could, uh, that are consistent with this in agreement with this kind of uh, system the, study the QO the, 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 the QO the, problem is uh, the of is the if I, I call it sorry is this is a QO problem because the, the, the spins have only two possible states it's a combina a, a B sorry um ah I missed the, the word uh, it's a by a binary a, a variable and you have the, the constraint so but we all, we all know that finding the ground state of spin glass is is, is hard and so yes and if, if the if the graph is non-planar it's an mp complete problem and this is there is a proof about the, about it yes and so so what is this so is your result restricted to to a planar graph or is it does it does the planarity not enter in your argument Mm, we start with a two-dimensional problem because it's easier. Move to a non-planar graph will be equivalent in some sense if we move to the three-dimensional problem. Um, it's true that if we change the dimensionality, the, 
the universality class, which is the, the thing that sell our result, uh, change. But we expect that, for example, the, the, the idea of the parity remains if you move to a non-planar graph, because the Hamiltonian is uh, is blind to the to the um, to the graph in some sense. So the the fact that the parity uh, uh, symmetry remains for non-planar graph is the main idea that we can apply these ideas to the the really hard problem or to a three-dimensional one. But something something has to give, right? Because we know that the 2D uh, spin glass is easy, the, the planar spin glass is easy, the non-planar spin glass is hard. Uh, you're saying, well, we can have the same symmetry um, and so we can do the same analysis, um, but, but it's, it's... I would always think that, that the fact that these problems are hard are related to a, to a vanishing spectral gap. Uh, uh, right. I, when here so, say hard is hard in the sense of using classical computing, classical optimization. The right. yeah. okay, yeah. so here I we are talking about using quantum computing, the quantum analyzer to solve the problem. So right. it's possible that the, the the idea is that it will be that the the classical problem for two dimensional or non planar two dimensional graph are in different uh, complexity classes yeah. but in the quantum classes complexity classes they belong to the same one so you're saying that there's a quantum advantage this is what you suggest yes exactly. And, and... Exactly. okay so okay time is already up so Sorry. okay so please so close their uh talk and but uh maybe if you want to discuss more please uh, continue after closing the, this seminar so maybe uh, shanis please uh continue the open this uh, inca seminar uh, we, uh webinar uh, zoom okay so anyway so first of all i'd, I'd like to close the, today's inca seminar thank you very much for a very great interesting talk so let's thanks to the speaker yes thank you, thank you. so so if you want to discuss <laughs> with the uh, speaker more so please continue yes i'm unfortunate i have a meeting so <laughs> see you next okay see bye you.